Welcome back to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Uh, breaking news tonight. The Queen, after such an amazing day at uh, the start of Platinum Jubilee celebrations, has sadly tonight announced that she will not be attending the Thanksgiving service, of course, in her honour for her 70-year reign at St Paul's Cathedral tomorrow. She will, however, be lighting the first beacon for the beacon, uh, which is going to roll out, of course, across the, the country. So I'm hoping that means she's not too bad. It just means she can't travel at the moment, because Windsor Castle to St Paul's is quite a hike uh, at 96 when you've got mobility issues and clearly suffering some discomfort, as the palace has said in their statement. Well, I'm joined now in the studio by Van Countess Hitchingbrook, uh, Julie Montague, author of The New Royals and Royal Commentators, Katie Nicholl from Vanity Fair and Kinsey Scope. Welcome to you, Kinsey. You were so excited to see me earlier, I thought I would double your excitement and bring you from the Fox studio to here. So welcome. Thank you so much. I am a huge fan. <laughs> well, I'm a big fan of yours too now, so that's two of us. Um, um, what is, to start with you, Katie, if I may, uh, this is not good news. I mean, whichever way we try and dress this up, to, for the Queen to miss the big Thanksgiving service, she's a big church goer, mm. a big believer. Well, she's the head of the church. Yeah. So it's a and big deal. For her not to deal. be there is a big deal. What, what are we reading to this? OK, so I'm going to preface it by saying it, it is a shock. I know of people tuning in this evening and thinking, oh, gosh, you know, mm. this is not good. It, it, it's not great, but... When I came on your show a few weeks ago, I said to you, I was told by a source close to the royals that nothing was certain. Yes. Because, she, as you pointed out, she really wasn't very well. So the fact no. that we've had two balcony appearances today, yeah. the lighting of the beacons this evening, I think suggests there's no need for alarm bells to be ringing. However, it's going to look very strange. And as soon as I heard that news, I thought, do you remember in 2012... And the Duke of Edinburgh wasn't at that service at mm. Thanksgiving and how strange it felt. Yes. And I just think... When you take away the Queen from a service of thanksgiving to thank for her life, yeah. it's going to look very strange. Well, also, it's a little bit um, sort of cursed, this event now, Julie, because we've already had the Archbishop of Canterbury pull out because he got COVID. He was supposed to be officiating. Prince Andrew, whose appearance in itself was going to be very controversial, I think, because uh, last time he appeared with the Queen was at Prince Philip's funeral and people didn't really like it, the fact that she was appearing to sort of accept him back into public life. So he was due to be there, but he's also tested positive for COVID. So there's a lot going on. There is. It's going to look very empty, I think, tomorrow at the service because now the Queen won't be there. Prince Andrew won't be there as well. And I do think that there might be, a, you know, that moment of awkwardness because then you have Harry and Meghan coming and we know that they obviously uh, still have a great relationship, as they say, with the Queen, but the Queen will be missing. Mm -hmm. So I think... There's going to be this moment of, you know, what is going to happen? Who, in there. Is where it, they, exactly. Who are they going to be sitting next no to? No question. I was told by a very good source it was pretty tense today that behind the scenes, apparently, there was some disquiet from palace officials that Meghan and Harry turned up apparently 15 minutes late, not for the actual start of the parade, but 15 minutes later than they were supposed to. And apparently it was all quite frosty behind the scenes and the rest of the family went out in the garden and were milling around and they just disappeared. So there's already a lot of tension there and the only glue, it seems, in this whole tension is the Queen. Absolutely. And she's now not going to be there. So we're going to have a bit of a drama tomorrow morning, potentially, in a church where there aren't many of them and the ones who are going to be there don't get on. I agree, and I think that it's really important to the Queen that the family is united. I think it's important to her because she's concerned about Prince Charles, and she wants everybody to accept him, and she wants there to be healing and peace. So I, I, I'm concerned about tomorrow's well. Yeah, I mean, look, let's just hope it all goes peacefully and well, but it's, it's not looking particularly good, is it, given all that's been going on? I just want to go through well, some of my highlights. I was right there at the Palace today covering it for Fox in America, and it was very moving the whole day, it was very inspiring. It felt me very proud to be British, actually, I have to say. It showed the country at its best. It was a beautiful sunny day, and the mall was absolutely teeming. The atmosphere was fantastically positive. So after all the mayhem of the pandemic, and given that the country is ravaged by inflation at the moment, many people are really feeling the pinch. It was a great celebration of what it is good to be British, and I love that. Um, but there were some heroes and villains today. Inevitably, the villains were led by radical vegans who decided to try and ruin the party by throwing themselves over railings and lying, pretending to be dead on the floor in front of some of the, uh, the military as they went by. They were immediately flatlined by, I think, meat-eating police officers. Um, I don't know what it is with vegans, other than they're permanently angry, and dare I suggest, they're hangry, because they're never having a good meal. 
And this is what happens when you don't eat a balanced diet. You literally go nuts. So they tried to ruin it. They got removed. Uh, in my heroes category, you can't get past little Louis, who's Kate and William's youngest, who basically spent his entire time on the balcony pulling faces. Um, we did a montage of his greatest hits. It's from the Daily Mail, I think. This uh, Absolutely spectacular. Although I did caption it, is this the moment Auntie Meghan arrived? Um, <laughs> it's probably the reaction of most of the royals. So that was most certainly in the thing. And talking of Auntie Meghan, um, she, she was caught, of course she was caught, because she was going to make sure she was, uh, through the balcony for the troop in the colour. So this is the behind the back of the palace, that balcony, sort of res very much appropriately the reserve balcony, um, which is where she found herself, along with being in an outhouse rather than the primary balcony. And this is her having the audacity to tell the young royals to shush because they've been yapping too much. This from the greatest yapper in the history of modern monarchy. So a little ironic, if you don't mind me saying. Were, um, you, were you silenced or were you, si were you silenced or were you silenced? Was I silent or was I silenced? Exactly, yeah. A, it made me chuckle anyway, whichever way you look at it. Um, I'm joined also by royal biographer Tom Bow, who uh, is in central London. Tom, um, you've just written a book about the Duchess of Sussex. Um, don't want to dwell on her too much. I do want to ask you about the Queen because it was a very, you know, it was a wonderful day, but it already felt to me quite bittersweet as it was, because I, I just felt, look at this woman, she's 96, we're not going to have another jubilee for her, unless she lives to be 106, which is unlikely. So this is really the last chance to say a proper thank you and, and celebrate her reign and her life. And it was all magnificent, but then tonight we get this sting in the tail that she can't attend the St Paul's service, which I know will be a huge blow to her because she is the head of the church. Well, you're right. It, uh, it is very disappointing. Uh, but on the other hand, on the plus side, Piers, it does mean that uh, Netflix won't get the panning shot of Meghan to the Queen. <laughs> and that'll really annoy Netflix enormously. So there's always a bit of a rainbow. I mean, on that, on that Tom, I have to ask you, I mean, you know, my, my big objection to Harry and Meghan is primarily the, the rampant hypocrisy that accompanies almost everything that comes out of their mouths. And we saw this acutely when they keep preaching about the environment and about the need to save our carbon footprint. And then we discover they got here from California on a private jet. I mean, when they do things like that, I'm like, who buys this nonsense? Who, who, who lets them behave like this and thinks this is actually good? Well, you get excited about that. I get excited about Meghan appearing in this extraordinary hat with a big smile and letting down the window of her car so she can be seen. Yeah. I mean, here is a woman who, as you know better than anyone else, uh, according to you, lied 17 times mm. on the opera show interview and hasn't yet apologised. Right. And why has she come here? Has she come here to apologise to the Queen? Has she come here to uh, say that she's sorry to the Duchess of Cambridge? Or is she here to promote herself? And I thought her big smiles as she edged towards the window to make sure that the camera should see her mm. with her oversized hat was all part of the Promote Meghan show. Yeah. Uh, that's really quite extraordinary, I thought. Well, and it is extraordinary. She played it and for it's, what it's worth. Yeah, and it's, it, is, it, it chips away, I think, at the magic of the monarchy because they've already got this huge problem with Prince Andrew and there's no doubt that scandal's been very, very damaging to the brand of the monarchy. The fact that the Queen's second son has had to write this huge cheque for millions of dollars to basically pay off a woman who, who was taking him to court over a serious sexual assault charge. That is unprecedented in modern times for the monarchy and a very damaging thing. But I also think what you're seeing, this turmoil, uh, turmoil we're now seeing on, in the Commonwealth in the many countries, uh, I think you can directly chart a lot of it back to the Oprah Winfrey interview where Meghan Markle made these serious allegations of racism against the royals but didn't actually say who she was talking about, thereby almost bringing them all into the frame. And I think you're seeing the, the, the kickback from that. Absolutely. Now, I, in my book, forthcoming book, which is out next month, I explain very detailedly in detail how the uh, Cambridge's visit to Jamaica was predestined to be difficult, if not disastrous, because of the effect of Meghan and the racist allegations she made. There's no doubt that across the Caribbean and across other parts of the world, Meghan's allegations of racism resounded and had a terrible effect mm. on the image of the Queen, on the image of Britain and the royal family. And to see her then smiling 
through the window of a car and which she'd let down the window and standing close to make sure that she should be seen in the uh, on horse cars parade today without any contrition whatsoever yeah. just shows what a brazen hussy she is yeah well your words not mine but i'm not denying them um <laughs> let's let, let's just come to katie for a moment uh, about the main event today was the Queen, and it was spectacular there. I mean, I really did feel moved by it. Mm. What did you feel? You've covered the Royals for a long time. What did you feel? Um, it, it felt very special. I was commentating for the BBC, so I was in a little commentary box with Jamie Lowther Pinkerton and, um, and Hugh Edwards, and it was, it was an incredible experience. I mean, nothing beats that balcony mm. moment. But I think there is a sense, you know, a jubilee is as much about looking forward to mm. the future as it is in being in the present and celebrating the present and also reflecting on the past. And I think there is a sense of what to come. This feels like a final hurrah yes, for the does. Queen. And I think for all of us, even you know, regimental men of Jamie Lowther Pinkerton's status, there was a lump in the throat. Yeah. And that is because she instills this the pride that you're talking yes. about. I don't think you have to be a royalist. Um, but to appreciate what someone has done over the course yeah, of I agree. 70 years. I agree. She is a remarkable... Well, Johnny Rotten, woman. actually, from the Sex Pistols, who famously sang God Save the Queen as an anarchy song to get rid of the monarchy, even he said this week on my show that he has great respect for the yeah. Queen personally, which says it all, I think. Um, Julie, we've got some clips here. These are world leaders paying tribute to the Queen. President Biden, President Obama and President Macron. Let's listen to these, because they're quite telling, I think. Your Majesty, congratulations on your platinum jubilee. For 70 years, you've inspired people with your selfless devotion and service to the people of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. On behalf of the people of the United States, we send you our best wishes to you and the people around the world marking this momentous and historic occasion. You are the golden thread that binds our two countries, the proof of the unwavering friendship between our nations. We are grateful for your courage and we share the respect and love that the British people and Commonwealth have always shown you. I'd like to think Her Majesty and I have formed a special relationship of our own. Certainly I can say that getting to know her was one of the great privileges of my years in office. And I learned so much from seeing the example she set for all of us who had the privilege to serve. I mean, Julie, this reminds me of all the British Prime Ministers who've said exactly the same kind of stuff. They're all slightly in awe of the Queen. Even Donald Trump, the least humble man in the history of the planet, <laughs> even he admitted to being slightly humble when he met her because his mum had been such a great fan of the Queen. You know, put, put her into some kind of historical context. Yeah, here, you know? I mean, I think you can, you, you can look at sort of the Dalai Lama. It's, it's um, somebody who unites mm. and doesn't divide. And especially with the turbulence that we've all experienced over the past couple of years with, of course, Brexit and then pandemic, uh, Trump, uh, you know, and who was very divisive. She's always remained this person who wants to unite. Yes. And so for me, she does have this, this ability to do that. And it does remind me of somebody like the Dalai Lama, who is about compassion yes. and kindness. And yes. I think that's what she will be remembered yes, for. Yes, I agree. I totally agree. And I felt that with the crown today, it didn't matter what your politics were, because the queen isn't political. So by turning up, you're not making a political point, because she doesn't... He's not interested in that. She wants to bring the people of Britain together, whatever your political persuasions. Um, Kinsey, what does she mean to Americans, the Queen? And what do they feel about the next rung on the ladder, Charles and Camilla? I mean, we absolutely adore the Queen. Uh, she is selfless. And I think that we really admire her dedication to service because we don't see that a lot in America. Mm -hmm. We're very, like, shallow and selfish. Sorry for Meghan Markle, because I, I feel like there might be some association there. But um, I think there is concern over Prince Charles and Camilla because Americans take the crown as complete 100% fact. Yes, which, by the way, is not a good idea. <laughs> yes. Right? These are real saying. people. They're not fictitious yeah. characters in a, in a drama for Netflix. In yeah. fact, what Netflix should do is do a real one mm. on the Sussex. Or put a disclaimer on that, the original. Yeah, yeah exactly, yes. yeah. Uh, and I, I do think that they, we still love Princess mm. Diana, truly. We still love her, and we're, we still remember her. Yeah. Well, it's great to see you all. Thank you very much. Final word to Tom Bauer, if he's still there. Indeed, I am. Tom, just, just put the, the Queen into history for me, because I believe she's the greatest monarch we've ever had, followed by Elizabeth I and then Queen Victoria. What say you? <laughs> well, I'm not a great expert on every monarch we've ever had, Piers, but in our lifetime, clearly... But, you know, uh, before uh, Queen Victoria, there were people like Henry VIII did quite a good, good job of... He executed Britain. his wives, Tom. 
<laughs> yes, have Bettine. you cleared that with your wife? <laughs> <laughs> well, Henry the Seventh. Well, let's go over his father. His father created the navy. Uh, Charles the Second restored the monarchy. There have been a lot of kings. They all monarchs are just fit for their age. We've yeah. been very, very lucky. And, of course, we look forward now to Charles, uh, and until recently, with some trepidation. And I think what has been very, very fortunate is that the transition from the Queen to Charles has been taking place over, mm -hmm. what, one or two or three years now. So the sudden shock will not be the same uh, when uh, he finally becomes king. I think he's also changed. He's, he's mellowed. He's not being as uh, ostentatious and self-indulgent as he was. He's not speaking out as he did before. And he's got a, a gravitas. And I think the Queen, very rightly, from her point of view, said that Camilla should be the next Queen. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, I've, and know, that, that means that the transition will be smooth. Yes, I and agree. And I, I, having, having met them, I think Camilla gets a bad rap. She's a terrific lady. I think she's actually... They're great together, and I think they'll be very good for the country. So, Tom, thank you very much. Thank you to Pleasure. my stellar panel. Really appreciate it.